Uh, so can I introduce our guest today, uh, Mr. Peter Smith. Um, Peter's head of the uh, Wildwood Trust, uh, which is a place, if you, it's based down in Kent, and I would thoroughly recommend going to visit there. There you will see Peter's passion, which is uh, particularly, I think, the, the mammal, the wildlife of the UK. He's be passionate about uh, the fact that we should be sharing our existence here with our fellow creatures uh, rather than it doing anything else. Uh, but also Peter's very keen on the whole rewilding movement. The reason I've invited Peter here is, uh, it's not today's protest, but this week's protest, so there's a, an intense um, pressure now on, on the environmental question. And Peter, I think, uniquely combines an appreciation of environmental issues with associated economic issues. I think probably, Peter, your normal audience would be environmentalists, if I yes. read you right, uh, who is then tries to explain underlying economic issues. I think Fails this, to explain. <laughs> This audience probably has an appreciation of, of economic issues, but uh, I think it would be really helpful if we could join together the underlying issues of economic justice with the issues concerning wildlife and the, uh, the environment in which we live. And I'm ho I, my sense is you're as well equipped as anyone I've seen to be able to join those two together. So over to you. Thank you very much. Following on that theme, I think economic justice is unbelievably intertwined with environmental justice. The two are exactly the same. To, um, when we destroy the environment, we are stealing from our fellow man. We are taking away from our fellow man. But more we're taking away from our children. We're stealing from future generations. And that is quite obvious to me, and, but more so, economics, like natural selection, is the strongest force. Everybody is affected by every economic decision we make, just as we're all affected by natural selection, and certainly wildlife and nature is affected by natural selection. And to me, they are pretty much similar concepts. I first understood how populations of, of species work, and that mathematical basis gave me the tools to then go on to understand economics. And I don't see much difference. You know, how an elk population or a moose population varies with the bear population is just the same way as our booms and busts happen. It's a similar mathematics. It's all the same. So in understanding um, how we can both understand nature and how we understand economics, in, but what makes it so wonderful is the solutions to economic problems and the solutions to environmental and wildlife problems is one and the same. It's economic justice. Oh, the embarrassment of the court. So, what is nature? That is a concept that some of you might know, but I want to explore first with you what is nature that allows us then to fully understand what we can do when we try to protect nature. And a lot of people don't understand nature. So when I look at nature, I think of a web of mine. Um, I remember uh, hearing my great hero, Gerald Dole, tell me about the web of life, um, the apocryphal stories of Chief Seattle. Um, but the web of life is it's all right. It's all connected. And if you pluck one strand, you affect everything around it. And nature is so vastly complicated. It's so intricate. Um, my little brain tries to understand nature, but we are like worms looking at a television. You know, we've got no eyes to see, we've got no ears to hear, um, we've got no brains to process. We, our tiny little minds cannot comprehend nature um, at all. Um, but we can 
understand it a little better. We can use metaphysical concepts to try to understand it. But let me try and talk about nature and so So first off, one of the, um, the species I like to be wild, you know, that I, I, I want to see back in our country, is, is the wild boar. And they were nature, they were hunted for extinction. But the wild boar is an amazing thing. You think of a wild boar causing disruption, people complain about them picking up their flower gardens. But in a woodland, in the right level, a wild boar is cool. It is, it is a mutualist species with trees. Why does the oak tree have so many acorns? It's a bee. They've evolved. The oak needs the wild boar. The oak tree produces so many acorns, and they, those acorns never grow around that tree. The, the pests that live on the oak will kill any sapling. The only way the acorn can grow is by being taken far from the oak tree. And it's got its own little form of fertilizer. It's impossible. And there is a whole host of microbes and mycorrhizal fungus that fungus of the ground, the spores of which are within that little ball of fertilizer that comes out of the back of the wild boar that gets deposited with it, and then it can grow. And the only way an oak tree can have genetic diversity is to be transported far from another tree. And therefore, when some people look at a forest, <coughs> They look in the time frames of a human. When I look at a forest, I look in a much longer time frame, thousands and thousands of years, to see the life of an oak tree growing and dying, to see how it will be healthy with genetic diversity, how it will grow. There's far more complication. I'll get into some more interesting issues to do with that. But that's just some of the knowledge you need to understand when you start looking, say, at a woodland. The other species that's uh, our organization, what got me into rewilding was reading a Russian paper when I was a young student. They said, I've looked at a lot of conservation of these waters, swimming in the streams, we killed them all by pollution and hunting. And they all started to come back. But I read a little Russian paper that was translation that said, on rivers where you had beavers, you had twice as many otters as a similar type of river. And looking into why that was, what did the beavers do to create that? We also, so we went, and I was made a chap called John Callister. We had this idea, we were going to have beavers back onto the nature reserve in Kent, uh, how we fed. And it was a fanciful idea, but through severe determination, I raised a lot of money, half a million pounds to make it a reality. We played politics with all the trustees, and then we didn't want to do this to be, do this amazing first ever rewilding program in the country to show that beavers could do it. As soon as we released the beavers and they started digging into river banks and creating wetlands, waterfalls, the other little creature there, came back in profusion. And weren't recorded anymore. Waterfall numbers have crashed over the last 50 years because we've taken away all their habitat. So different species are intricately linked with each other, and restoring one species can't help restore others. Another project that I've been working on, that I've been poo-pooed many times, many years ago, is our friend the pine martin and the red squirrel. Where do you get red squirrels in Britain? It's got eyes <laughs> Well, apart from the island wine, <laughs> or Brancy Island, um, or a few little forests, in Wales, where they probably were reintroduced, but there's certain really bad plantation crusts where red squirrels can just about hang off the grist. You get red squirrels when there's pine marlins there. And we killed all that pine marlins, and we reintroduced, um, we reintroduced, we introduced, I think it was actually the guy who founded the Wildlife Trust to introduce red squirrels. Uh, uh, could be wrong, but um, so. This was well known to uh, ecologists, and I've been trying to get you know, pine martin reintroductions and worked, but it took two decades for science to catch up with which, you know, on the ground ecologists really knew that it was. So when you get pine martins, you have, it's not so much that they 
became graceful to change that behavior. Uh, the ecology of fear. So a graceful will change its behavior. It won't be able to feed on the ground so much. It won't be able to store as much food. While the red squirrel's already adapted, the native red squirrel's already adapted to live with the pine marten. And in Ireland, where they stopped persecuting pine martens and pine martens were stored, over the last 20 years, he went from nearly 90% gray squirrels and 10% red squirrels to And this is nature. You know, you explore it in modern concepts of, of chaos theory, flip states of different ecological processes. Economics is a bit like that as well. You can change kind of things and just things change. So you can understand that my job to restore nature is about trying to understand these concepts and then break down all the huge barriers of science, of rules and regulations, government regulations, resistance, conservatism within the existing wildlife NGOs to try and reintroduce those concepts. We've managed to breed red squirrels and release them to Anglesey first, and where they were protected, protected and grazed, but were persecuted. But now, because um, high markets have been introduced to Wales, we've been, for the last few years, we're introducing red squirrels to northern Wales, and they're doing well, they're succeeding. And eventually, I'm going to have red squirrels back in London. <laughs> and the south east. We're working on plans to do that right now. We're introduced by some more pine martens have been just released in Gloucestershire and across the Deep. I used to work for Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust. And hopefully we will slowly, by just reintroducing the pine martin, our children will have red squirrels back in their lives. And many of you will remember red squirrels. I saw a red squirrel in, in Surrey when I was about six years old. Probably one of the last ones in the area. But by getting rid of, by changing, you know, Pine buttons were wiped out because people were paid to wipe them out. You know, they, you know, was, they were you got money for handing in dead pine marten, you got money for handing more kinds of dead things, even wildcats and other things. So we've persecuted things, we've changed the land, but it doesn't mean we can't have a bit of wild land back if we do the right things. So I suppose economic justice is really the same thing. How do we identify the key that turn us from such a awful, monopolistic, extractive, abusive economic system to one that rewards people for doing good instead of rewarding people for doing good. And finally, we've got to talk about the wolf, right? Many of you may have seen the, the, the story of how wolves change rivers um, in Yellowstone, beautifully mm -hmm. done in that tech talk by George Monbiot. But even in this country, we can have walls and links and bears back to some areas, say Scotland. And we've got huge challenges because it's all about land use and the people who own the land, how they're going to have this stuff. But that's where we talk about trophic cascades. How having a top predator creates the balance, the, the ecology, to have just the right amount of herbivores munching around the woodlands to create these hugely diverse habitats of high forest growing down to dwarf scrub to grasslands, all of the beautifully intricate mosaic that provides a home for the rarest of wildlife. That's what the wildlands all about. It's about getting nature back to look after itself. And then instead of human beings trying to go out with bill hooks trying it in their local nature instead of trying to protect this little butterfly, hugely inefficient. And uh, it's what I've wrestled with, with the conservation organizations I've worked with. Why are you spending so much money to achieve such a tiny amount? And you're not going to protect the butterfly anyway, because there's no other butterflies in the area. And in one chance bad winter and the butterfly's gone, it's not going to come back. So we need to create a, a system. And the only way we can do that is, believe it or not, economics. How do we stop people farming rubbish land? We have to change the margin of production of land to get to the point where the land that we're at the moment subsidizing farming to be on comes out of production. Stop taxing poor people, stop robbing people of jobs by taxing their labor to then go and give to somebody to destroy wildlife. Because that's what we're doing in our whole system. We are, we are impoverishing people. We are causing untold poverty. You know, the, the poor person working in the shop over there you know, all their money goes on rent, they live in awful economy.
competition, they are getting taxed. Their wages are being lowered. So we can give money to landowners to destroy nature. Now, now you know why I'm so interested in economic justice. <laughs> right? And the wolf symbolizes to me, if we can have enough space on all the marginal land that's not worth, it's only dodgy tax breaks, um, it's subsidies, it means it's worth funding. We can have an ecology where the wolf returns and there's enough deer and there's enough natural animals living in harmony to have this rewilded Britain back. And that's got a lot of benefits. Right, moving on to the last of understanding nature. Nature really is complicated. And when I said we are a worm, we are indeed a worm. We do not understand. Science is always telling us new things. Trees talk to each other. Trees have their own economy. They trade. They support. A mother tree feeds its daughter trees through the tiny symbols of mycorrhizal fungus that connects them all. A forest is alive with signals telling them about threats of uh, insect pest species. They adapt the genetic plasticity for, for trees to change. They trade nutrients with each other. They support each other. They support dying trees. There is a whole economy under our ground. And there's more things that we don't know. We're just beginning to learn what is nature. It is vastly complicated. So we have spiritual things, trees, you know, the, um, the, using spirituality, spirituality. <laughs> as a metaphysical concept for that which we don't understand. But nature is vastly complicated. Let's move on to ecosystems. So we talked about nature, but nature is more than just the birds and the bees, the different animals, the ecology of them interacting with each other. We now look at ecosystems. And we can start with my favorite species, the beaver. So what does a beaver do for us? Well, a beaver is a keystone species. A keystone species affects its habitat. So in a river, at the moment we have a river on, a, uh, on your left um, that is just a drainage tunnel. It can often dry out the land around it. It's got no wildlife in it. Um, it can't buffer flows. You know, it can't trickle water out when it's dry. But as beavers move back in, they start creating little dams. And finally, they will braid channels, as it's called. They will create vast wetlands full of the most unimaginable wildlife, all for no human effort. That's why I was so desperate. And 20 years ago, I started the process of bringing weavers back to the UK. Because I know they're just going to go and create huge amounts of beautiful wildlife habitat, which they are already doing in Scotland and in parts of England. And finally, I hope all our rivers will be restored to a natural state. And they have many benefits for us. Let's have a look at a, a rewilded river system. So, as you get into the uplands, you have... Can't see. Sorry? Can't see. Okay, don't read it. I'll post the talk and you can read it over. I'll cover the main aspects of words. So, right up in the uplands, you know, you've got peat bogs. They've all been drained at the moment released vast amounts of carbon dioxide, maybe more, and we'll talk about that in a minute, than uh, cars pumping out um, petrol gas. But they're also a giant sponge, and they suck in rains of the uplands that cause flooding. They also release that water slowly. They buffer the effect. They provide services to man. All the way as you come down the river, you have, as you rewild the river, you create things that are good for people. They trap sediments that go down. They, they protect soil. They will filter water. They will take out pollution, all forms of water pollution. Um, you know, just the costs of sediments moving down our, our damaged rivers can't put our water bills up by maybe 100 million pounds a year. And you start looking at what's, what's it cost for flood defences. You know, maybe that's a couple of hundred million pounds a year. And you start looking at the costs and pulls as we damage nature are far greater than the tiny amount of money by a sheep farm up at the top of that 
river system that's destroying the whole system. So we've got to look at how um, the economics of that river system can be changed and actually profit us. You know, can you imagine how much money is saved from insurance and flood defences if you don't have flooding in the town further down? You don't know how much money the environment agency has to spend to stop towns from flooding. Look how much money has been spent to stop uh, London from flooding. One of my uh, other lectures is uh, called 20 Tons of Gel at Night to Save London. Yeah. And uh, I haven't got it up here, but um, essentially, if we blow flood defences at a few parts of Kent, uh, Gel at Night's really environment friendly, apparently. So. <laughs> um, uh, not much pollution from this explosive threat. If you blow the sea defences, the coastal sea defences, at certain points and have that re flood where you get the storm surges coming in. That stops the storm surge coming into London, which we've got the Thames Barrier for. They're talking about building another one. Two billion, five billion quid. But the land, the reason the storm surge comes up so far, there's no salt marshes left to absorb the salt marsh as it floods. It's all been funneled into London. And then you've got the water coming from, you know, the Cotswold Plain, coming down the Teddington Bar. Well, what happens if you rerouted some of those uh, upland areas on the, the Oxford Plateau and you go and blow the cliff defences and recreate the North Kent and uh, Essex salt marshes, that would cost hundreds of millions, but you wouldn't have to spend billions on flood defences. In all to protect farmland, it's pretty useless. It doesn't produce much food. See, economic justice is rewarding. It's the same thing. It's just learning. Really learning economics will teach you how we can afford very easily, just from those basic numbers, how we can afford to reward. Um, as we look at exosystem, ecosystems, <coughs> we've got to think about ecosystems are much more than you think. The Earth. The mountains, the very minerals, the very air we breathe is all created by biological activity. Not all, but a lot of it is. Uh, we wouldn't have the atmosphere we would have without microbes producing that oxygen. The, um, the carbon chemistry of mountains is mostly from biological material that's within it. That's then released and reabsorbed. Even plate tectonics and subduction as one plate goes over another, is speeded up by the minerals biology has created. The whole Earth is a living, breathing entity of vast complexity. You know, so you get into the Gaia theory, I am a literalist, or I'm an artistic literalist. It's just that which we don't know. We just need to get science better to understand the complexity of the universe. You know, when we go back, let's go back right to the start of the universe, the Big Bang, right? We blow up in this amazing um, creation of matter, energy first, and then matter from the Earth, the Sun's core, that's hydrogen, helium, helium. Then in the nuclear furnace of those second sun generation suns, or the first generation, I shall so say, you have come being produced as that those stars then go supernova and blow the carbon out. And it might have gone through another star and then eventually gets to make coalescent and form an Earth. And we've got carbon. So what are we going to do? That carbon is interesting. Carbon is the very building block of life. Everything in our life um, revolves around the complexity of carbon. And one of the um, my theses that I rather egotistically called Smith's first look. <laughs> what is life? Life is the energy. Better expressed as negative entropy, which is, I'm trying not to uh, tell you in that. Basically, it is the energy of complexity. When you form complex molecule, it is held within it. And life is best expressed, I think, as that energy that's held within complex molecules. Yes, we've taken energy from 
the sun, mostly, and some geothermal energy, especially when life started, geothermal energy down in the volcanic um, areas under the sea that started life off. It created, it took that energy and it created something wonderful, something that could get complex and grow, and we're moving towards a world. So if you want to think of it morally, things that create complexity are good, and things that destroy complexity is evil. Strong word. But, so that idea that life is the sum total of energy held in complexity. And eventually, and evolution, I think, is the process, and is the process of getting more efficient. It's, it's taking the sun's energy, geothermal energy, which is nuclear. It's all nuclear. Every energy in the universe is nuclear. What the Earth is only hot because of uh, radioactive heat inside. Okay, it's not left over from long ago. It has held its heat. It's, it's new energy being produced from the universe. So we've created and um, we've got better. But modern man is destroying, taking complexity in oil, in soils. Um, in nature, and we're turning it into carbon dioxide. Simple. And that energy is released and lost to us. And so we're robbing from nature to give us. Now, we're not doing that much efficiently. That's my problem. I don't mind exchanging energy. Life is an energy exchange. But we're doing it really inefficiently. So, my next graph is a simple idea of carbon cycle. Nature's got, and we're talking about ecosystems, nature's got many cycles within it, nitrogen cycles. Do you know that the only reason you've got forests in parts of Alaska is because of what bears do in woods? <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm jealous, but I'm not. Without the nitrogen released from all the fish that take nitrogen from out in the seas and swim up the rivers that finally end up in the jaws of a bear, of a grizzly who goes off and do their thing in the works. Those trees will be broken. But that's a small cycle. We've got big cycles. Carbon. Carbon is responsible for every, the bad use of carbon, or the bad state of carbon, is, is responsible for every mass extinction in the world's history. Either too much or too little. You know, when the, when the meteorite of the last mass extinction hit, it wasn't the meteorite so much as it probably caused volcanic activity elsewhere. In India, Indonesia, super volcanoes, open uh, lava flows, and that create put too much carbon in the atmosphere and kill all the wildlife. Off. And it allowed our the little shrew ancestors of us to um, survive and finally we evolved. We've had other mass extinctions where um, we've the, the, the trees life stayed too much carbon, the carbon atmosphere, and we created a snowball earth where there was only a tiny ring around the equator of life. Everything else was just mass glacier. So when people go on about uh, global warming being dangerous, believe them. Getting an imbalance in carbon could destroy humanity. That's complete. And it's complicated how that I don't profess to understand whether our release of carbon will create some kind of positive feedback loop that will then release more carbon from our deep ocean setting. But if it does, we're gone. Completely. Humanity is destroyed. And that's, but I, I am a man of science, and I don't want to, I want true science to be there. But the risk is always there. Understanding geology, history, carbon, chemistry. But what we do know, and um, something this graphic will um, allow to understand is how carbon works. So in the oceans, there's only a small amount of surface uh, carbon dioxide, carbon deposits in the surface of the oceans that interact with the atmosphere. In, in, on land, most of carbon is actually in our soils. And when we drain soils, when we farm soils, that's all oxidized in the atmosphere. And we don't understand a lot of that. That needs a lot more money. Not only the stored carbon and fossil fuels that we use as well, but we've got to think is how can we, all that fossil fuel use, all the stuff that's going from land into um, the atmosphere, 
how can we suck that back in? And this is where rewilding our 40% of the UK, all the farmland that's not economically of any use, will suck that carbon back into the ground. And it's enough carbon that could actually stop us from having runaway climate chaos. It really is that much. Around the world, we're destroying all the forests, we're draining, you know, we've got Indonesia, you've got the palm oil plantations where they're putting all these drainage channels in, chucking the, the, the forest down, palm oil plantations going. The real danger is from what's happened to the soil there. Some of that soil's really peaky, it's a huge amount of soil that's built up over millions of years. As soon as you start draining that land, it all starts, you know, wandering off into the atmosphere. And it's pretty dangerous stuff. So that's what I wanted to talk about ecosystems and trying to understand those. So let us bring us back towards more your standard lecture. Let's talk about the natural history of destruction. Natural history, the history of natural destruction. And when we understand the loss of nature, we can look at it in two ways. A bit like economics. You can start off in looking at a linear model, what I like to say, your sort of Karl Marx, Malthusian model, <coughs> where you can see that long ago, Stone Age man with big spears, probably hunted <coughs> with wolves, actually. Yeah, that was the, our earliest uh, relationship with wolves we hunted together. I mean, there's lots of good evidence coming through in genetics. And um, so, they would, we, would, we would deliver cue de grass with our clovis points, and we killed off all the mega fauna. So your woolly rhinos, your giants, your, 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 your woolly mammoths, all that kind of stuff. Climate change, yes, I see it was coming, but it was man that delivered the coup de grace to the mega fauna um, across Eurasia and North America. So that was the first of the man-made mass extinctions. Our, I mean, I know we think about spears, that was one area, but it was also the atilat. You should come to Wild and have a go. You can get a spear with a spear thrower on the end that allows you to throw it really accurately and fast. You know, you can imagine that that's, that's how our, our ancestors would hunt. And they could take them, so they take them there. The wolves would track them. we track along, but even not with some of us, are built for running large distances. The family would follow on behind, and we'd go and eat off the woolly rhino for the next couple of weeks and make all of our tools from it. That's how humans, when we ran out, and this is the chicken and egg, when we ran out of mega fauna to hunt, nature had to be the mother of invention. Did man discover farming because we discovered farming? Or did we discover farming because our old way of life, of hunting metaphor, there wasn't any left? That's an interesting philosophical question. And um, because the cattle were roughly the same time. So then we started domesticating animals and domesticating plants, <coughs> and we started farming. And we had mixed land use for a while. <coughs> that land took away from nature in some ways. So We'll come through to modern life. Then something started changing, probably in the Bronze Age, right? But we don't know much about the history of the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age collapsed, um, for those that have studied it, part of the BC. Was that a systems collapse? Was it a climate collapse? Or was it because we farmed a bit too much and we destroyed land and other things? It certainly happened really too well. So let's get into the modern period. Let's move past the um, Iron Age, when we come to the Roman period, the Latifundi, we started creating a system where we started causing another environmental collapse. So we had giant landlords, slave labor. The actual people of the land had no work, they were on poverty. We had labor, but it was slave labor, employed by giant landowners that took the wealth of the whole Roman Empire. And it took a while for it to collapse. But those farming systems robbed lots of wildlife, lots of wildlife died out in that period. And when Roman, um, you know, fifth century, when uh, Roman started to collapse, a lot of forests came back. But we started a process whereby we took away 
um, nature, but then we suffered the consequences of that. So we naturally look at that other system. So we've looked at a Malthusian line, you know, technology advances and we destroy nature as our technology grows. But we can look at another system, is land ownership and environmental plants. And there's wonderful examples for that. <coughs> the first example, which is the first written thesis on um, economics and wildlife destruction, is Plato's, mm -hmm. where he discussed how their wooden walls of Athens, the Athenian wooden walls were their shapes. They built their wooden walls, as the oracle of Delphi told them to, to protect their nation. But once they built their ships, they chopped down all of their trees to do it. And all the soil was eroded off the hills. It destroyed their farming systems. The poor um, were then funneled away. The landlords made, if it wasn't for uh, Solon trying to put limits on how landlords extracted wealth, but Solon, could, through economic justice, could have created the Athenian um, revolution and culture understanding the land economics and debt, which Solomon did. And so Solon is could be the first Georges, or, or whatever you want to call them. But they created this, but their empire destroyed it. Their empire robbed them of the trees that protected their soils and stopped them all flowing off. Their, their, their agriculture in the Attican Peninsula was destroyed. Plato wrote all about this. Now they needed to go and import grains, mostly from the Ukraine through the Black Sea routes. They had to have wars of conquest to protect their routes, and they had to buy trees from a certain area a bit north of Athens. Um, Macedonia, or Macedonia, um, if, however you want to pronounce it, and a certain Philip of Macedonia, who had a son, Alexander, enriched by the sale of those trees that then came back and delivered the final death of Athens. So you could see that the Athenian fall, the rise and fall was the good treatment of land and then the, the environmental fact. Very similar situations have happened elsewhere. In Sparta, um, the 300 of Sparta well, we know the Battle of Thermopylae and the 300 who uh, defended um, from uh, Xerxes. But what you don't know was the system of land ownership. Well, you may not know. I've, I've done a bit of a study on this. The system of land ownership in uh, Sparta. Through Spartan history, and this is quite unique, they had female inheritance of land. It was actually a good thing. But it was still concentrated in the few parts. So each year, you had more and more land concentrated. And they had political battles in their political system over the few very wealthy landowners. And those trying to have enough land to become a Spartan warrior. Over time, they could support less Spartan warriors. And eventually, they had a civil war. Just so the elite landowning I think it was actually 400 landowners, not 300, but it sounds different. But, um, 300 um, landowners so, uh, had all the wealth of Sparta, and they couldn't afford to deploy an effective army, and they were overrun and destroyed. So there's another lesson from history. The other lesson we can see from history is the Maya claps. Um, so the Maya collapse was again a theocratic elite to all the productive land. The normal population were forced to farm the valley tops. They had another environmental collapse as they destroyed all of that. It's all well documented. Then you had um, floods, landslides, washing away of all their farmland. The whole culture collapsed as, their, as the farm soils weren't there anymore. And that was to do with theocratic elite, took all the productivity from the land for their own insanely wealthy lifestyles. And I, my postulation is that the enclosures of Britain are doing the same to us. We took away the common land. We, where people could farm. And we are now deploying highly inefficient, high input farming systems 
it's taking away all our soil, you know, and we're going to get to a point where we don't have proper good, we're going to have to get better science all the time, more inputs of oil and chemicals to keep feeding ourselves. And systems like that, there's many other issues of history. So let's move a bit forward in time and come to sheep hardens to tragedy and the bed. So we're moving into Britain of today. And Henry VIII, others, he started making all the uh, the uh, land from the chuck, which was farmed in a more natural way, in a relationship with people. Not saying there wasn't corruption within the church owned lands and the rents they received from it. Um, but the, re the tragedy of the commons, of course, never existed. Harden was wrong. There was no tragedy of the commons because the commons was well managed. But it's only the tragedy of the unmarried commons. As we started stealing land, and I think Thomas Cromwell was actually a Georgist as well. You do some good reading on Thomas Cromwell. I know. Thomas Cromwell made a number of statements that have been written in history books where he said he wanted the land taken from the church to be a common treasury for all, to be the source of income for government. And he was killed by a landowning elite, the elite that still rulers today, because he wanted to do this. So they nicked all the land in quite a time. Yeah, but his, his work for the king, Henry, was probably to try and acquire the rents of the church to be the rents of government. Okay, to fund wars and whatever else he wants to do. So that's when sheep started coming in. More and more sheep started, and we started kicking the peasants off their land whether it was church land or common land, and slowly the process of enclosures happened. Those sheep were, they were a way of earning money as a cash crop, but they certainly, they bypassed economically the peasants. They had to go into poverty and starvation, and a few people who acquired this uh, land had a, had a um, cash crop to enrich themselves and the banking systems and the legal systems that into court, uh, the banking systems of the city of London were set up in many ways to facilitate this purchase of land from the king who kicked off the peasants' rights, church, uh, common land, so he could sell the land, and everything around us was built about the enclosure. A huge economic injustice. And then, you know, moving forward in time from the pardon's tragedy, not the commons, the triumph of the commons, we've got the Vet, the Victorian Edwardian de Sovia, well, all of our uplands. Uh, now got grass shooting estates and deer shooting estates. Again, burnt to a cinder so many times a year. Sheep graze, sheep wrecked, as I like to call it, where there's no wildlife hardly that lives on there. They destroy all of nature. They, all the carbon's gone into the um, soils as the soils are destroyed and oxidized. All the water runs off, causing us endless problems, even in London. Costs, all this kind of stuff. So there's all these tragedies. Moving further into time, dig for defeat, as I call it. We, yes, we digged for victory in the Second World War, and my great uncle Jack, that I have to mention, did dug up his prized rose bed and planted potatoes. Mm -hmm. I, get, I played on his allotment um, as a young man, and I can tell you that allotment was four times more productive than any farmer's field today. Because he had labour, his own labour and, and tax labour upon that land to create. My great um, grandfather um, was known as the best gardener in Bedlington. Any day of the year he could go into that garden and get enough food to feed his family. And that's what people used to do. And we need to bring some of that sort of stuff back. We can put labour onto land and not use inputs that are damaging pesticides, that are killing all of our bees and insects. All this kind of stuff, we can create systems where we can feed ourselves if we have untaxed labour and we don't have to pay the monopoly cost of getting land. Then we come in even more, everybody's protesting about Europe. I love bits of Europe. I hate the common agricultural policy. It's done more to destroy wildlife than any other system across Europe. We are essentially funding people to destroy wildlife and to have vast 
wasteful food mountains. We then even go subsidize food that goes and destroys the economies in Africa and the developing world where they can't, their farmers can't afford to produce crops because we're dumping our own subsidized food onto them, destroying their economy, causing poverty and destruction. Okay, so not so good. Europe, you like Europe? Go, go over to Greece, go over to Portugal, see how much you like Europe there. The economic system of Europe is disgusting, it hurts people. Okay for a few in Germany and the Netherlands and, uh, no, and uh, Northern France, not so good for other people. So think hard about Europe. I'm not with, you know, Brexiteers, far from it, because they would have worse. Um, but the systems of Europe are poor. Um, the tragedy of our national parks, we created a system of national parks that essentially sheep wrecked hillsides. Not, there's no nature, there's no more wildlife than studies, really good studies. No more wildlife in a national park than there is outside of a national park. How did we come, why has Britain got no wildlife in their national park? We've got sheep, it's land ownership systems, we have the effect of it. I, I mean, you might think I'm mad, but it's not, it's absolutely true. The modern nature conservation, the bats and the sacks, as I like to call it, biodiversity action plans and special areas of conservation. And we are curating, curating, like a piece of fine art, the last of the wildlife. This rare creature here, this dormouse, this heath returning butterfly. But we can't do it. We're still losing all those creatures. Because you can't just manage a tiny bit of land, which is the nature conservation I used to do in. We need to think bigger if we're going to protect what. And that's where I got into rewilding all those years ago as a young man. I wanted to make a difference. I actually wanted to save nature. I didn't want to just sit there and pretend to save nature, like my colleagues. You know, I didn't want to happily take my, my wage and just say, I'm going to do the best I can with these incredibly narrow defines of what you're allowed to do to save nature. So, the state of land of Britain today, we live in a vast agri-desert full of little wildlife whatsoever. The farmer's fields have got nothing, no wildlife. It's virtually devolved. The insect um, uh, numbers are, are crashing, um, small mammals, birds, all going down and down and down and down and down. We've got the sheep wreck bed, the Victorian and uh, dystopia. We've got polluted um, rivers that are shaved bare, nothing lives in the rivers that are not living here. We've drained our bogs and wetlands and we put sea walls across our salt marshes and dune systems, and there's no depth in our habitat in so many places, and there's no point. We're not getting a benefit from doing that. Only a few, it's, 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 the, it's the tragedy of the privates where an individual landowner can only make a little bit of money by destroying the wildlife there, yet it contributes virtually nothing to society as a whole. That's the way we've got to look at it. The utter tragedy, which Harden should have said, is the tragedy of the privates, how people take a profit from destroying nature. So why do we use it so badly? Landowners can make money. The only way to make money is to destroy nature. And you can use nature in so many ways. There's so many perverse incentives, the way our tax structure uh, doesn't tax land. Right? It's, it gives them tax advantages. All kinds of tax dodging. And the fact is, it's hard to employ people because we've got taxes on labor. Taxes on trade, in fact. This ignorance in policy, and I would say induced ignorance, because many people do understand, but they will never say it, talk about it, in high level policy makers, both of government and in wildlife NGOs, people I talk to, they just don't want to talk about land ownership. They don't want to talk, even talking about the cost of land. And I've watched land that I've bought for nature conservation go from 200 quid an acre to 14,000 pounds an acre for the same land. That inflation rate would shame a banana republic. But that's what we're dealing with. Why? Because nature conservation organisations have got more money. It's basic. The most unbelievably basic economic reason. You've got more money. You've got the, you're taking money from people playing the lottery and giving it to people to buy nature. So there's lovely middle class people and the other put on the middle class but people are giving money to nature conservation charities. And all that we're not buying any more land. The land market is just right. It gets even more perverse when you don't understand about the perversity of economics. We have subsidies. We've got things like higher level stewardship where we give 
certain landowners, with who don't quite destroy their land as much, you know, these wildflowers. We give them special subsidy payments. But what nobody understands, or very few people, or even they mention, they will lose a job, is by giving those subsidies, we've got more land in agriculture than we would otherwise have. By taking away those subsidies, you would have less land under agriculture. So instead of having that lovely old-fashioned farmer's fields with some lovely little flowers in them, you'd have a beautiful rewilded habitat, brimful of wildlife. You know, have a hundred times more biodiversity, that magic energy of life I talked about in a rewilded system. And that's what we need to understand about economics and the economics of justice. So, one thing I think everybody should understand, and NGOs don't like talking about this, we don't need a penny to save wildlife. I don't need you to give me a wage. I don't need to give any money to save. We just need to stop people properly from the abuse of nature. If we stop that, we wouldn't damage so much. Our economy can flourish. We can get rid of, rid of these, these futile dilemmas. Are we going to have jobs? Or are we going to have wildlife? It's a futile dilemma. You can have wildlife back without hurting anybody apart from a few fat cats who are looking at the, 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 the uh, people who profit from the banking, the legal <coughs> administration of land, and it's, it's uh, getting the value of land that sucked from the rest of the economy. And we can do that simply by essentially following the teachings of Henry Joe, even Adam Smith. Whoever you want to see, whichever economist, that basically tells you we shouldn't be taxing people's wages, we should be taxing land, and bringing that into the modern sphere, taxing carbon and other environmental externalities. Because it is the most powerful force. I mean, can you imagine what would happen? Something a bit like when we taxed plastic bags a couple of years ago. Within a month, 90% drop in plastic bag. We taxed sugar a few months ago. 50%. 50%. Imagine what would happen if we tax land. There would be a huge drop in land use. We would build our buildings better, just as the Georgia's economists have been telling us. We'd use less land, we'd have more efficient transport. It would pay for itself anyway. And 40% of Britain, all the, the, the floodplains, the rocky areas, the areas of clay soils that can't be farmed well, the uplands, it would all rewind. And we'd have nature saved for our children and forevermore, just by taxing. And if we started taxing carbon externalities, we would get the most fuel efficient cars. Every human brain, every company, every organization, would every, it doesn't matter whether you're environmentalist or you hate the environment, you would be working every single day to reduce the land use and everything you use, everything you exchange with anybody else. You would be working to reduce the carbon use, the pollution that is created, and every good and exchange that we have. Yet we wouldn't have poverty because government revenue would be so high that we could afford to have the best hospitals, the best schools, the best education system, psychological counseling for every person we look after. <laughs> 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 you know, we could look after people. The feckless could all have a house. It doesn't matter. You know, we could all have a standard of living that would exceed anything in any country in the world. I like to call it the, the Star Trek world. High technology, low environmental. Impact. That's the world we would create by true economic justice. Getting into those fundamental solutions there's other things we need to do. We do need to have a nature grid, allow animals to move around. You've got to think that, you know, towns would fund the countryside. There's a lot of good economics by some people sitting in this audience. And it would show that people in marginal areas, uh, rural and marginal areas, would not be taxed. And their, their economic activity would flourish. Because a lot of people I deal with, you know, are people who are going to lose out from the market. They're not going to sheep farm 
how they're going to flourish. Well, they're individually going to lose out, but their whole society will blossom. You know, you go into rural Wales, their society is awful. You know, it's, it's pretty grim. People are scratching a living. Under a land value tax system, externality tax system, they're connected to that. But not the individual farmer, the people who control the land at the moment. And that's the psychological problem. How do we get out of that idea that my privilege of a piece of paper that says I want to build this world, why is that so important? Well, it's only important because of the, the economic benefits you've got at the moment. You take those economic benefits away, and you've got to do that with that bit of paper and chuck it. What do you piece of land is a chore? It's a responsibility, economically, as well as for other reasons. So land will shift into the hands of those who use it wisely, or it will be full of nature. So <coughs> we'll internalize all those externalities. Lovely cases, of course, water. Um, water, what we should do is have an abstraction tax. We do kind of have that. The Environment Agency could fund all its activities, flood defenses from an abstraction tax. By doing that, we then could give everybody so many thousands of litres a year free. So everybody gets the basic. You use more than that, you pay your tax. But more than that, now, every time you buy a bottle of Coke, all the, the um, water costs, the, however many, you know, 20 litres of water it's taken to make that bottle of Coke, will now be contained within the price. The oil that you've used to make that bottle will be contained within the price. So you're now going to start choosing the manufacturing process that can reduce the amount of water in your bottle of Coke. And everybody will start choosing the products that take less water that's been you know, unsustainably pumped from under. You know, you don't know what's going on under the ground here. We're pumping all the water out. It's concentrating in pollutants that are coming from um, uh, the um, Oxford. It's, uh, the water under London is getting really polluted. You can see it all coming through from the 1950s when we started chucking rubbish on it. All the nitrates and phosphates is getting concentrated in there. There's less and less of the aquifers. We wildly will refill that aquifers. Help us. But it's still a problem. We'll have that vibrant economy through economic justice. And my last piece, I know I'm going over a bit of a time, people will talk about population. And that's something that I'm sure somebody who's more acquainted with progress and poverty will tell me. Is it chapter 8 um, in progress and poverty? I should have looked it up before we talk. Population control, the Malthusian of the Georgist concept. We've got these two concepts going on. Now, as an ecologist, I know that some species can self-regulate their population. They really can. And when resources are scarce, they will self-regulate. And this happens in many populations. Humans can self-regulate their populations, as George told us. He's, there's nothing wrong with their progress in poverty when it comes to that. He saw that certain societies that have real economic had stable populations within the world. Only when you had no economic justice, warfare, poverty, the humans produce lots of children. And the Malthusian concept, of course, is we'll just always have too many children and population's always going to go up and up and up. Well, look at the statistics of world population. They're starting to pull out. Where it's not going in this ever Malthusian more and more people. They're starting to plateau as more and more people get enough food to eat and enough education. I like to liken this to, you know, I was talking about stability, good and evil, carbon, complexity, or the destruction of energy. When you educate, when you look after people, when you have social justice, you have security from warfare, crime, that is stability. And it creates healthy minds, it creates stability. And you reduce our populations just as Henry George told us. And it's right, it happened, you can see. Good societies, no growth in population. Bad societies, explosive population growth. So that's the thing we should take. And a lot of people criticize my talks by saying, oh, it's all rubbish, because populations are just going to keep us. But unless we hammer down, we're going to stop people. And some of the wisest people, you know, you know, David Attenborough in this world, they go on about, you know, this is their Malthusian. They think unless we have coercive population controls, we're going to destroy the planet. It's not true. What we need is economic justice. So I told you that economic justice will truly save our planet. And it will on so many of the issues I've talked about. So just recapping, 
Having economic justice, the land value tax, the green taxes, help reduce our population, it'll take away the incentive for war and crime in so many ways. It will make natural destruction expensive in every economic decision of every human being across the world. It will make poverty history, and you'll all flourish. We'll all have enough money for wonderful education, treat each other with respect. A huge swathes of land will be protected. It'll start sucking that carbon back into the ground, and we might be able to stop us destroying that one. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you, Peter. That's a real tour de force. I was going to say it's really helpful to have joined up thinking, but certainly in my mind, I think what you've happened what you've been able to do is remove some of the barriers. History is one thing, classics is something else, economics is one thing, ecology is something else. Uh, it's obviously, you see things in I'm a very... I'm polymath, I like reading. <laughs> um, everything, I, you know, I read about three books a week, uh, learner books, and I think it's only my autism that allows me to study so many subjects and read so many things. I can't keep people happy or never get me to share a conversation. <laughs> anyway, well, well, thank you for sharing all that with us. Because I think what comes out of it in a unifying way is just this sense of justice yes. and, the under, and the underlying force uh, <coughs> that, that would be released uh, when we move towards justice. And appreciate your, your sense of hope for the future, that there is... Uh, despite all the, uh, the difficulties and challenges, there, there is room for optimism and having a positive outlook on the, uh, on the future. One day we'll achieve the Brodensbury world, yeah? The, the Star Trek world, hopefully. <laughs> we must think that. Before we start questions and answer, Peter, would you, because uh, maybe the sense of some of your lecture it was quite idealistic, but it might be, would you we just like to spend a couple of minutes before we take questions and answers just describing some of the actual pra the work, actual okay, practical yeah. work that you're engaged with, we get a sense of what's actually happening here and now on the ground. So um, what I do is, is run a, a sort of animal park zoo. Um, not that I ever liked zoos, but um, a long time ago, I, with a couple of chaps, wanted to reintroduce beavers. And for that, we needed a zoo to quarantine them when they came in. And we came across this place in Kent, and um, we quarantined our beavers there. They were going to go bust. Me and a, a friend called Ken West, um, who was a trustee, tired businessman, we decided to form a charity between the two of us. I just put the paperwork in. We took over the charity. And we took over the business, um, first on a lease, then bought them out. Um, and we formed to do more work like reintroducing beavers. Um, beavers were, as I said, the most important animal for rewilding. Um, and since then, we've gone on to breed lots of animals like dormice, water voles, red squirrels, reintroduce them. And we also have natural woodland enclosures where we have rescued bears, wolves, uh, wild boar, all the animals that used to live in Britain to recreate a wild wood. And... You could say that me understanding economics is how do we actually really create some wildwood back in the UK. Um, so the charity is quite large now. Um, we've got about 130 staff. We opened another one in Devon. And I'm working on my third in Enfield, take over of 250 acres of golf course owned by the council, if they let me, and um, rewild some of that area. As rewilding is just about creating the natural processes and the habitat that gives thousands of ecological spaces, um, made popular by various people, George Monbiot, um, Isabella Tree's book, Wilding. Um, I, I, her husband, who started off Charlie Burrell, Sir Charles Burrell, um, I got involved quite early on, but he came, the person who advised him was a European rewilding enthusiast, and there's American rewilding back in the 80s, late 70s, 80s, and that's where I started learning from their writings in the early 90s when I was starting to be an ecologist. So learning the, the 
IDS that rewilding really can bring back all the rare wildlife. And it, it's been proven now in a number of ways that rewilding is a really good idea. Um, we just need to do more of it. And the thing that's stopping us is the land. We need to acquire land. Lots more land, please. Give me land, lots of land. Starry skies above. <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, thank you, Peter. Are, are there any questions for uh, Peter? Um, three hands gone up. Yeah. Should we just yeah. go that and then take Chairman, go for it. Um, Peter, back and then Christian. So, uh, the National Trust have lots and lots of land. What is their attitude to rewilding? Well, I worked for the National Trust. Uh, one of my first jobs. I'm not very qualified to level three in countryside management and worked at Wallington Hall in Northumberland. And their, their attitude there was appalling. A bunch of chinless wonder um, halfwits who wouldn't know wildlife if it came and crashed into their faces. That sounds awful. Um, what do you really think? <laughs> <laughs> they are better than they used to be, but they still farm a lot of land because they receive subsidies. So even, even if the National Trust was morally wonderful, full of people who understood ecology and how to manage it, they couldn't afford to do it because of the way our economy is set up, the way farming subsidies are. So that to give it morals is pointless. They live in a world where they are subsidised. A lot of their income from the farmland they own has to be farmed in a way that fulfils the rules of, you know, the various rules of subsidies whether it be higher level stewardship, stewardship, the common agricultural policy, the single farm payments, it all has to, in all those rules mean you have to farm that land and you've got to sell the products as well in the commercial sphere. So it's very hard for them to derive income from that land to pay for their, their bureaucracies. I mean, when I was at Wallington Hall, they rebuilt a tennis court for the cost of something like £40,000, because there was a tennis court. And we weren't, I, I had a good game of tennis in my youth. I wasn't allowed to play there because I was a humble worker. Um, but the guys from head office, five miles away, could come and play tennis. They spent so much researching on how to put this water, uh, this mortar in a wall, right, to rebuild a wall, but all their land was being farmed to with an inch of its life with no wildlife on it to help subsidise what they do in the built environment. So there's, there's tensions within an organisation. I would like um, National Trust, and many people in the National Trust have talked about it, to rewild some of their, their ideas, but culturally they've been stopped. They try to uh, rewild an area in the Lake District, and the farmers got so upset that they were going to rewild this area, that they bought a farm to rewild. How dare they challenge? the cultural perceptions of farmers that they must farm and control land and you're not allowed to do anything else but farm. So there's all kinds of cultural effects. Uh, you know, the, inalien the, inalien the inalienable right of land ownership of the National Trust is something I would like to use as a legal power to acquire land for rewilding, for national parks. The National Trust could be Actually, I've written a paper about this. Um, uh, how the National Trust could use its powers to purchase land that then could not be resold that would allow us to have true national parks and to have those national parks rewilded so we could have a Yellowstone of Britain or national parks like you have in Germany or other places. So the National Trust has massive potential, but because it's run by a bunch of chinless wonder landowning um, uh, squirearchies, it will never do that. It's a closed oligarchic system. So I once wrote a paper in my um, political part of one of my master's degrees on the uh, politics of the National Trust. It is a closed, self-electing oligarchic system, but how do you penetrate that system to have better decision makings for the land that they hold in trust? Thank you. Thanks for that. That was a full answer. Yeah. Really, um, the sparrows have virtually disappeared from London. It's quite a rare sight to see one. And I wondered if you knew why. 
a lot of people ask that question. It's very difficult if you put your scientific hat on to give absolute answers, right? Why are there no starlings as well? You know, where's the murmurations in the evening of the starlings? There's lots of creatures that have gone, not just sparrows. And sparrows' have, numbers have dropped. But one of the ways to look at, um, and I'm not an expert on birds, um, but essentially the feeding of sparrows is small grains, occasional small insects, I believe. Um, same as starlings. All the farmland around London, many areas, there's no, there's hardly any insects. Insect numbers have gone down. All the plants in crops, the weeds, as we could like to call them, or not, plants, they've all gone. So all the little seeds, all the insects, all the small mammals, we've destroyed the very basis of the food chain. The soil's been disturbed. The microbes, the fungus that lives in the soils, um, all to grow crops. And there's nothing left. So across the whole of Europe and the world, we have started picking apart nature. And as an indicator, we see farmland bird species go down. Sparrows used to migrate, and starlings used to migrate in and out of London to get their food. And their numbers are going down. Uh, the, you know, London was just a big roosting site, I should imagine. Gardens have been built over. There's less stuff in gardens for people. Um, but don't think that the built environment is the reason for wildlife decline. It's not. It's what we do to farmland. It's the, the destruction of real wildlife. That's where most of the land has been destroyed. And that's probably why. So drops in insects numbers, the food availability of um, weed species, natural, natural plants, um, it's all gone because we've got better pesticides, better fungicides, better herbicides. We've got bigger tractors, all destroying the productivity that would feed wildlife. Uh, Peter, thanks for an excellent talk. Um, my question is, if um, you took the sheep off the, the British uplands from all those grouse moors and um, etc. And you had a free hand in rewilding that area. What what would you what would actually happen? That's a very. It, it takes a long time to rewild and not so long, depending on areas. If you just take sheep off, you can have some bad effects. Certain plants, um, purple ryegrass, can take over areas without having a the right type of grazing on it. But essentially, in time, native species will win out. And you will have a growth of woodlands, self-seeding woodlands. You'll have some non-native species, but native species will eventually win out. But what you need to do is having the herbivores and you know, those strands of nature, which are herbivores mostly, at the right concentrations and some of that would have to be managed because we don't have wolves and bears or lynx anymore eventually if it's a big enough area you will be able to start reintroducing wolves and lynx and bears and don't get on the 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 i blog a lot about these issues and write a lot about these issues you think wolves are dangerous wolves will save lives they won't take lives and you might think how on earth that you just have to understand what they do wolves will cut all the red deer um, in Scotland. At the moment, you get quite a few deaths every year from people hitting them in your car. Um, a wolf could cut the, a few wolf populations would cut the deer numbers by a quarter. So you'd probably save a couple of lives every year. How many lives do you think a wolf's going to take? One every 150 years, perhaps? Because that's about the rate what you've got in Russia, um, you know, for population by population. I do proper statistics, don't I? Um, and so, you know, you go out into a rewilded habitat with a wolf or a bear, the dangers to you that day, statistically, are getting out of the shower and driving to the area. They are orders of magnitude more dangerous than being killed by a wolf. So we've got to understand danger of a really rewilded, because a lot of people think rewilding is just throwing some wolves out. No, it's getting the land back to being wild. You get various succession happens in vegetation, being able to get the right species to manage that 
is important. Your different forms of wild boar, maybe a bison, um, some wild horses, all of which we're trying to work out how best to do it um, in a natural way. That's the, the end result. And of course, we don't want these people, there's lots of people use rewilded areas, nothing stopping people using them, having cabins and recreation in these places. It's all good stuff. You'll probably end up earning more than what we're earning from sheep farming at the moment, if it wasn't subsidised. Um, the economics of rewilding is very interesting, and there's a number of studies that have looked at this very thing, that it is, it is only the madness of agricultural subsidies that makes this happen. Does that answer the full question? I haven't given you... I'm not a botanist, so I don't know the exact successions of different species. I just, just wonder how you would sell it to the farming community. Well, you can't. You can't sell it. They're going to they're gonna whinge and whinge and whinge and whinge, just like they are. The rewilding efforts that are going on in, in uh, Wales at the moment between the sheep farmers, and I've met lots of sheep farmers, and I, I've got nothing against them. You know, these people have struggled to get their tiny plot. Wales is totally different to uh, England. Much more diverse uh, land ownership in Wales. These people have struggled, family struggles to acquire land. You know, we're taking away their livelihoods. There's no way of rewilding. The trouble with wilding is overall the economy, economy will do better for those villages and towns and rural Wales, but not the individual sheep farmer. You know, it's they will lose. And nothing you can say, they will lose. The landowners will lose. But why are the landowners getting so much money from the public pass, both from subsidy and the fact that they own monopoly. Why is that? Why is that moral? Well, it's no more moral than anything else. But why do we have these rules about land ownership? It's just pieces of paper. Surely, isn't organic farming going in the right direction? No, the wrong direction. Why is that? I'm being, I'm being um, nasty and, and deliberately challenging. Organic farming is just a set of rules and regulations by the assessor of um, you know, what, what's sold in shops. There are many organic farms that have got no wildlife whatsoever. They're just as bad as non-organic farms. Depends how you farm organically. Just saying something's organic is just a process. You know, you go to the soil association, you get a piece of paper. That's meaningless. I want to get the very roots of farming. What are the inputs? What are the chemicals? What are the processes? And by doing that, you, you take away those inputs and how much oil has been poured into that and whatever. Organic's good, but if you change to an economic system, every farmer will be out competing to be the best organic farmer they could possibly be. They'll spend so much time understanding their soil structures, the humus content, because that's how they're going to make a profit. And under our present system, it's everybody who can destroy the soils and destroy nature and has use as much oil as possible and as little labour. And it's no different with organic farming because the economic incentives are for the organic farmer to push the rules as far as they can, still using antibiotics in cows that milk, still using some fertilisers and chemicals that are allowed under the rules of organic farming. We, we're talking about a different way of doing things and perceiving how farming happens to produce the most food possible for the least damaging inputs. Does that answer that question? Mm -hmm. I, I must be mistaken as to what organic farming is about. I thought that's what it was. No, ah, but it is just... Organic farming is a point where you get a piece of paper to say you're a, an organic farm. But the economic underpinnings of all farming, whether it's organic or not, are still pushing us to have as much inputs as possible. You've also got the issue that you need to produce food efficiently on the land we've got as well. And some types of organic farming won't do it. Big organic farming. My uncle Jack, I keep my great uncle Jack, he had an organic farm that was called an allotment. And he had bone meal that he used to put in his trenches. And his was a damn sight more um, productive than any commercial organic farm. You've still got the problems of labour inputs. And that's why getting to the very roots 
We'll be what did um, I remember the name? The guy who quoted, um, "There are thousands hacking at the branches of evil to one who strikes at the root." Through uh, Henry David Through. That's what we're trying to get here. We're trying to get the roots of why farming is bad, for, is inefficient in its land use and inefficient in the way it damages nature. So we can all eat the most environmentally friendly food and have enough land left for nature. And there's plenty of organic farms that have got no nature on them at all. Wallington Hall, yes, yeah, in Northumberland. Yeah, I was going to say whether it was there or Craigside, they've got uh, red squirrels, I recall. Yes, and pine martens coming back as well. Probably be they've got red squirrels because pine martens have been. We stopped murdering pine martens. Um, I was talking to my father about this last night because I come from Northumberland. Anyway, my yeah. question was I don't know if your voracious reading has included 21 lessons for the 21st century Ferraris. Mm. I've read Sapiens, yes. He um, suggested that uh, the main concern was not who controlled the land for the future, but who controlled data. And it does seem that um, land value taxation, in practical terms, is getting a lot of political opposition. It's not a vote winner. Whereas taxing um, Facebook and Amazon and Google, etc., might be more. I, I, I think what Henry George, if you want to take him as a point of reference, really told us that all monopoly is bad. Whether it's a platform monopoly of a social media, whether it's how a bank produces uh, money is, is when you take out a loan, um, all monopoly and externality is bad. And the, what, it's not the only way, but the best way to deal with it is through taxation. But you've got to think that, say, the data owners of the future, right, the controllers of the human mind in social media are going to be just as powerful as the landowners today. And if we can't get land use tax, we aren't going to get a data tax either because they're going to control and bribe the politicians and create the systems of government like our House of Commons and House of Lords that will protect their privilege. It is privilege that is our enemy. It is that which we must educate and get people to take away privilege and not having justice. Thank you. Yes. Um, it's very inspiring because I'm really do think that we need to think about the children coming up. Absolutely. But what can we individually do and how can we inspire our young ones? Ah. Well, isn't that what George said at the end of Progress in Poverty? Education is the key. I wish I knew. I mean, I, I we choose to educate um, in our charity a lot of people. Um, my son's very sick of land value tax, I can tell you. He wants to become a banker and use his knowledge of uh, land economics he's got from me to become immensely wealthy. Um, <laughs> hopefully he'll grow out of that phase, but um, he's only 14. Um, I don't know. If I knew that, I'd have done it. It's a simple answer. I, 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 it's, 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 it's the what's wrong with economic justice and Henry George and land value tax and all the, the green stuff around it. Well, the problem is, is people with power want to keep the system the way it is, right? So I always think the only logical um, problem with, if we get a land value tax, it's the smash my baby's heads against rocks problem. There will be people who will smash babies' heads against rocks to get that privilege back again. And how do we create a stable society full of educated, harmonious people to not want to create such division so people can steal privilege, right? The evil that is in this world. And that maybe having evil in privileged positions is the only way to stop us having civil strife and war and, and, and um, terrible things. Maybe that's why Georgism can never work. Um, who knows? But we can only talk and educate. I, tr I work with others and try to communicate. And people are sick of hearing me. Every conference, every speech I talk, I, they, they want to hear about rewilding. But 
you know, I'll talk about rewilding for the first few minutes and then straight it's land value tax. <laughs> Everything else for the rest of it, and uh, I never get invited again. Um, <laughs> but that's all we can do, you know. We are great, you know, many people can try. We are just one, a few people, we can only do what we do. But don't give up, you know. I used to say this when I was in the bar in the student union. They used to, you know, people I used to say, oh, I'm going to be radical, I'm going to change the world. And I, I'd, I'd say in response, if I can make the world a tiny, tiny little bit better by the time I leave it, I'll be happy. And by having such humble expectations, has allowed me to keep growing. While many people have fallen by the wayside and gone off to become bankers and other horrors and play a role in the, in the subjugation of others through economic injustice mm. or through power systems that, that give them privilege. I've tried to keep out of it and just do work very, very hard and be honest in my thought. Two more. Uh. something that I've, I've witnessed myself within the environmental, the ecological, um, and nature conservation movements. Um, at times there seems to be a real sort of disconnect between the economics of it and the, the ideal, sort of the objective of mm -hmm. what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, specifically, I use an example. I, I was uh, once at a, a meeting that Polly Higgins was sort of involved in chairing and, and talking to various people, and um, we had sort of environmental lawyers there. Right? And um, when I said, "Well, isn't it important to sort of value, give a value to nature, give a value to natural mm. resources that we're using or abusing or whatever we're doing," to then know what it is in fact we're losing once they're destroyed and depleted. Um, they said, well, nature is priceless. You can't put a price on it, you can't put a value on it. And I'm, so I immediately thought, well, isn't that interesting that you know, people who claim they want to sort of save the planet and, and, and save nature and environment and provide a better world for future generations refuse to, to look at the economics in that particular way. Mm. Which I know you What is the cost of losing the bee population to us economically? I mean, we have to put figures, and, they, and, and people have started doing it. Yep, the, but there's, there is, the, there's this incredible resistance within the, I mean, this is what yep. gets me, incredible resistance within the environmental movements to do that. There's a big argument going so on. Could you just I'll try to explain the argument. Yeah. So, we've got the, the uh, natural resource assessment in this various government money and nice academic positions. and. There's a whole movement right up from international law and NGOs and government circles right down to, and I know some people involved with that, used to uh, work with some of the people. And they all are trying to calculate these magic figures of how much um, we're going to lose if we get rid of this um, bit of wildlife. If we damage this river, how much is the flooding going to cost? If we lose the bees, how much is it going to cost in, in productivity and farm produce? So the, the problem I've got with that whole argument, and then you've got the other side of the argument, the, the ultra green, right? And you know I've, I've talked about Zen and the art of land value tax and the green movement, where you've got people who say you can't put a price on nature, it's all priceless. And, and that's, that's rubbish, but they're all wrong. The whole basis of that dialectic thought is wrong. So what if you know how much of a bee? Is it say the bees are worth 25 billion pounds a year to our economy, right? Or three trillion, whatever it is. How do you estimate that amount? Your, your, your estimate's going to be wrong, whatever you do. You can only make an estimate and it's going to be wrong. But it's pointless. They say, if I knew this, I could tap on a, a door of a politician and say, look, it's bees are worth three trillion pounds. Great. Are we going to protect them? And the politician's going to go, yeah. Not to change, not to do anything. The only way it's going to do anything is if you now tax the things that are killing bees, right, and derive an income from that, so that you stop the destruction of bees. 
you have to internalize the externality to the economy. Having this academic figure is a pointless exercise for academics to get papers. And when I point this out to the very academics who get pointed, I never get invited to those conferences because they don't want that answer that what they're doing is utterly pointless because no politician is going to listen to them. They, what they'll do is they'll form committees where they'll all go and talk about it and they all feel awfully important and have joint press releases that sound really important that have no effect on the world whatsoever. And the Greens who see, you know, the, the George Monbiot, I've actually talked to Monbiot about this a bit myself, they go along, you can't put a price on nature. Well, that's stupid because unless you get involved in the mechanisms of the economic process of life, you're not going to make any change anyway. So you can't be too priceless about it. But you don't have to calculate the cost of a loss of a bee. All you have to do is make the destruction of the bee more expensive in our everyday lives. <coughs> system that Henry George talks about. Now, what I was going to ask, I don't know if it's possible to answer it, but is there any shift in the political doors of, of getting a shift in the ideas and the beliefs and all the nonsense that you're revealing? Is there been any, have you kicked any asses lately? Yes. Any <coughs> I have kicked a couple of asses, Excellent. as you say. Can you tell us about No. <laughs> there are some things, there are people in government and often, the people you least expect, and I can't tell you who, which politicians, uh, because that would be a breaking of confidence, but there are politicians who you'd utterly least expect, while some politicians who you think would be good would be beneficial. Let's just say, in the process of rewilding, especially in my work with beavers, has been extraordinarily difficult legally. And things, supporters have got messages to government ministers at various times that have given me pieces of paper that have created the ability, or given other people I've worked with, the legal right to reintroduce beavers in a certain way, or they've stopped organisations from killing those beavers because the law says they shouldn't be there or whatever, and the law's an answer. Um, so there are politicians... But remember, when I learned political lobbying and political science many moons ago, I remember Des Wilson's A to Z of... So my two Bibles for politics are Machiavelli's The Prince and Des Wilson's A to Z of campaigning. And he said, moving the government's like hitting a sponge. You can really make an impact, but as soon as you bring the fist away, it's gone. And there's been a couple of times I've managed to get a fist in and allowed the beavers to survive from my political knowledge and the moves are the rewilding movement certainly moving on they are now you see all the major uh, ngos are now having their own version of rewilding they'll call it wilding or they'll call it something else because they have to respond to the rewilding movement and they will start doing bits of rewilding it'll never tackle the real land question because most of the major ngos will never address the issue of land or challenge land-owning privilege because that's where they got most of their money from. Most of their trustees are probably involved in some way in extracting money from the privilege of land ownership. So they're never going to challenge that. But you can make little differences. There's areas that are becoming a bit wilder and we're starting to reintroduce red scrolls and pine martens and there's more beaver little projects going on. So we can make little wings. But we're still not addressing those fundamental questions of how do we get more land in a wild state? How do we suck more carbon into the soil? How do we make it more expensive for people to destroy nature? And, but we have made, look, the plastic bag tax, the sugar tax. I think they're, they're little things, but they're things that have worked. And if we could do more of these little things, maybe people will learn from it. That taxing bads and untaxing goods is the way to solve all of our problems. You know, yeah. just keep going, getting that little bit more. Let's extend it. Let's get a proper carbon tax. Not some ridiculous carbon trading system where you get carbon credits and you give 
um, the land barons of carbon of the future get the right to pollute. Let's have a proper little carbon tax, right? Let's have a little water tax. The, the environment agency has already actually increased their abstraction fees, which is helping. Let's just keep pushing those little things better in little ways. One last question. Uh, James. If rewilding is good, surely enlightened organic farming is equally good. Nope. I know a farmer who sells in the Maryland market for 15 years, and he puts down 250 tons of organic matter on his 25 acres each year and produces potatoes to die for. That surely is good. Of course it's and good. Surely is if, if what I want to do is turn every farmer, whether they're good or not, into the same environmental damage and food production of your friend by having the very economic system to turn everybody into somebody who uses less inputs onto their land and more of their brain power, like your friend who obviously understands how to create good quality crops with less inputs. And that's what I'm talking about. It's not to say, I'm, I've got this problem with organic. It, it's just a piece of paper from the Soil Association. It's, it's nothing special, right? Um, I actually dislike all forms of accreditation, right? They're monopolies in themselves, yeah? I love a, the forest school system, just for a few people to make money from. It's dead easy to have a forest school. We want to reduce the barriers to somebody becoming an organic farmer to use less inputs not have a system of bureaucracy involved with it. So that's the only difference. Um, it's good to use less inputs. It's good to produce food with less inputs. Your message is, surely, that, that nature is super abundant. Yes, nature. Boundlessly resilient and productive. Why, then, are you concerned about population growth? Oh. And you gave the example of your father yeah. growing on potatoes on a yeah. small Okay, that's more, it's much more complicated than that. You mean subduction and organic minerals, minerals created and systems created and change subduction flows, yeah. Um, it's really complicated. If you're not uh, into proper geology, it's hard to understand, not that I do. So what you're saying is nature creates far more biodiversity and productivity when it's rewilded. The ants in my woodland right? The wood ants, the red wood ants, there's more mass in those red wood ants that have a relationship with oak trees, mostly, than cows on a farmer's field. The rewilded habitats got far more carbon, far more life, far more creatures, biomass of every kind than ever in an organic farming system and certainly in a non-organic farming system. Where land is of no economic benefit, it should be rewilded. Where land is productive, it should be productive with the least inputs possible, so far less um, growing of meat, more organic crops, far more arable fields of vegetables than just pure grains, more people working that land more cleverly with their minds untaxed than having, you know, agronomists with vast computer databases and drones flying over the land calculating how much pesticides because that's where all the money goes at the moment it's you know don't think that a farmer farms the land anymore it's an agribusiness of many farms come together with an agronomist who gets paid off by the chemical companies to have vast computer models of how much of this chemical you put on here and that's what's killing all of our wildlife because it's a desert it's got no wildlife on it and there's even agronomists for organic farms doing the same, calculating how much can I get away with of killing nature for growing crops. I, by having this economic justice system, we turn it all on its head. People are rewarded when they use the least amounts of inputs. And all the minds will be put on how to be just as good as your friend who's the organic farmer. Everybody will be trying to get there to produce so much food with so little inputs. And wages will be a lot higher. And the rural economy will be so much better. Do you play that record? What about population, please? Oh, I've talked about population. The better you have 
where you have stable states of individuals... Why do you want to limit population? Okay, the world, the world is indeed a well-provisioned ship, but there is only so much limits to how many people can live on it. Each person does cause problems for other animals. We have to be in harmony, and we, what we want to create is a stable population, maybe you're having a slightly declining population. But human waste is a great fertiliser. <laughs> um, sometimes. Uh, it can have heavy metals in, and it, it isn't always sustainable. I don't believe it. OK. <laughs> Read a scientific paper on it. Copper. I think that's the biggest problem. You said that, that, that nature cleanses itself. It can. Yeah, I think this is turning into a bit of a, a debate. I think yeah. maybe at the time we've moved on, I think we've had a very full afternoon from you, Pete. I think we've greatly appreciated your inputs, which have been lacking in chemical fertiliser, computer programmes and, and pesticides. I think we've had a fairly uh, full and pure input. Um, and there's been plenty of food for thought. So uh, thank you very much for coming along and sharing your uh, great breadth of ex both experience and learning with us. And I think it's been a very thought-provoking afternoon. So thank you for the invite. Thank you very much.